uh, evolution of the number density of dark matter in, or a wimp or something in the expanding universe. Okay, so let's see. So to solve this completely, you typically solve it numerically, right? You can find computer programs out there that will do it for you. Things like micro omegas, or you can programming it up in Mathematica. But I'm not going to solve it numerically here. Uh, we're going to do some uh, hand-waving sort of uh, twiddle level, level analysis. Um, before I try to solve this, maybe I will, uh, I will set you a homework problem to, to uh, lower your appreciation for me immediately. OK, so uh, this, this is the way I like to think of the equation, but this is not often the way you see it solved, right? So there's another version of this equation that you may have seen. Uh, and uh, let me write it down. So, and then explain why we bother to do this and what all these different letters mean. Um, and then your homework is to prove this. But it's not actually that hard, so don't. Uh... No. <laughs> but we can talk about it if you want. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. So the reason you do this is because if you look at this equation and just forget for a second there are any interactions, so you just have a free uh, uh, massive particle or a free particle wandering around in expanding space, you see that uh, even in the absence of interactions that the number density, because of the ex expansion of the universe, the number density, you all know this, scales as uh, 1 over a cubed. Right as the universe expands. So it's useful, instead of thinking about the number density, to think about the co-moving number density. And that's where this quantity y comes in. And you, you write this as y is the, the number density of uh, the state you're interested in divided by the uh, entropy density. That's what s is. And uh, you know that uh, the entropy density uh, just um, redshifts with the expansion of, uh, of the universe. So this is a constant. And so it's useful to talk in terms of this uh, um, co-moving quantity. And then the other thing that I've introduced is this quantity x, which is uh, mass over the temperature. So it's, the, it's a use, another useful quantity to think about um, is the ratio of the particle's mass to the ambient temperature. And so if you go through and uh, I think you have to assume to get to this, you have to assume as is the case for a WIMP, that the, uh, the, the universe it finds itself in is radiation dominated, which is to say that the Hubble constant, uh, shouldn't put an equals here, I don't want any equals anywhere, um, scales as a temperature squared. So once you go through and make these substitutions, you can uh, uh, get to this form of the equation, which is often the way it's solved. And the reason I wanted to write that down is because then I wanted to, to draw this very famous plot if I was as eloquent as Christopher Marlowe, I would say this is the plot that launched a thousand papers. Um, but I'm not very eloquent. Uh, so this is this famous plot, right? Uh, you've probably seen it many, many times. So the, these are the variables that is written in here. X is the ratio of the mass to the temperature, and Y is uh, the co-moving uh, number density. And uh, <clears throat> up here, at, at, this is time is going in this direction. That's good, but temperature is going, growing in this direction, right? So at, at early times, at high temperatures, you can ignore the mass of this particle if you're in a very hot early universe. And then you know that the equilibrium number density goes as T cubed over here. And over here, the equilibrium number density goes as uh, you would expect for a non-relativistic non state. Right? It's Boltzmann suppressed. Um, because the temperature is far below the mass, okay? And then the, 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 uh, the, so if you were to follow, if these interactions you have here were strong enough to always keep you in equilibrium, right, you would just follow this curve. This is just the plot of the equilibrium number density as a function of, of this variable x, and uh, it would be bad if you stayed on this curve forever, obviously, because your uh, number density gets exponentially smaller and smaller the longer you stay on it. But the point is, at some point, the uh, interactions will no longer be the thing driving this equation, and instead the expansion term will be the thing driving the equation. At, at very, very high temperature, H, so let's go over here. Very, at, as I already said, H goes like T squared over M Planck, right? And the other term, 
that I need to compare it to is sigma v times n. And I've already told you that at early times, n goes like t cubed, right? And so if we imagine we have some weak scale scattering cross section, then this will go like uh, t cubed from the n, and maybe it goes like uh, a t squared times g Fermi squared for the cross section. And you see that this, this term wins over this term. So the dynamics are driven by the interactions, and that gets you into equilibrium. So you follow the equilibrium number density. But then at late times, at low temperatures, you see the converse is true. And you're driven not by the interactions, but by the expansion. And so you don't expect to follow, to track the uh, equilibrium number density anymore because you can ignore the right-hand side once the scattering cross-section becomes small enough. And so the, de the details, the numerical calculation that one has to do is to work out how long you follow this trajectory for, right? And when, you're, when you fall off the equilibrium density, obviously it's going to happen some point after the temperature's below the mass because then the interactions that we were talking about, right, uh, were a two-way thing you could go, that's, this is what's keeping you on equilibrium with the standard model bath, but once you get below the temperature drops below the mass, it's hard to go uh, this way and easy to go this way. So you start to deplete your abundance, and, uh, but then at some point you can no longer interact because the expansion rate is so fast that you can't find your friend to annihilate with because your friend is disappearing over the, you know, far away because the universe is expanding and you fall off that trajectory. And that is freeze out in a nutshell. Okay, and so, and like I said, what you would really do is you'd stick this on a computer and you'd solve it carefully. And uh, the hand-waving solution I've done is to say, early on, everything is driven by this term and I just track the equilibrium number density. And at late times, the equilibrium number density is so small I can forget about it. And if you remove this term, then this equation becomes easy to solve, right? It's just a simple differential equation in terms of y. And then, uh, uh, and then, so late times, you will, you will uh, again, just redshift. Your, your y just becomes a constant. And so the only thing you have to figure out is what is y at the freeze-out point? What, at what temperature do you freeze out? And what is y at that freeze-out temperature? And then that is the co-moving number density you will have for all late, later times, once you can ignore this contribution here. Does that make sense? OK, so now I'm going to try and solve it to get an approximation for what that freeze-out temperature is and what that freeze-out uh, number density is, but without <coughs> actually solving it. But if you want to do it honestly, you have to use a computer. But I'm not honest. Um, OK. So the approximate solution is just simply to say, when do these two, two terms when is the point at which I move from only caring about this term, or sort of rather only caring about this term, to only caring about this term? Well, that will be the point at which the two terms are equal. So that's something I can solve for. Right? Um, so freeze-out will occur <coughs> when those two terms are equal, which is to say when the, the number density at freeze-out times this scattering cross-section or this annihilation cross-section is of order the uh, Hubble constant at free time. And that, that will determine this point. OK, so then we just have to remind ourselves about, uh, well, I've already said it happens after x equals 1. So we know what the number density is. Right, there's some prefactors that uh, counting number of degrees of freedom that I'm going to ignore. Uh, Okay, so you can solve this, uh, and uh, what you find is you find now change variables to this x quantity just because it makes things easier. Uh, so I just took logs of both sides and then threw away the bits I didn't care about. Uh, because the leading term is this, and then there are small log corrections that depend upon the, the mass of the dark matter. Okay, but then that's that basically determines for you the uh, the the point at which you detach from the equilibrium curve. But we don't really 
necessarily care about that so much. We want to know how much dark matter is, is left when all this is said and done. So what we want to know is we want to know what is the freeze out, uh, number density at freeze out, right? But we've already decided we have an expression up there that we can solve to get that. Okay, so that's just H freeze out over sigma V. Okay, or oh, in other words, uh, this superior variable um, is, let's see, T freeze out squared over M Planck uh, sigma V divided by the entropy density at freeze out. Okay, so that tells me what uh, Y is. Again, I don't really care about why. One more step down the chain of logic is what I really care about is I want to know about um, what is the contribution of dark matter to that pie chart that I showed you earlier, to the, to the, um, to the matter energy budget, right? And what that is, is you take uh, this, this Y at freeze out, and I told you that once you decouple, you, you, you have this y at freeze out, but then because this equation is simple to solve, you just keep that y for all future times, right? You've decoupled, and now your number density just redshifts as 1 over a cubed because you no longer have any interactions. So you don't care about this term anymore. So at some later time in the future, like now, uh, your y now is the same as y at freeze out, okay? Uh, and so... So y now is the same as y at freeze out, and how do I turn how do I turn y into a number density? I just have to multiply by the uh, entropy density. So I take the y at freeze out and I multiply by the present day entropy density, right? That gi that will give me the present day number density. Uh, but I don't want the number density; I want the energy density. So then I need to multiply by the mass, and then I need to divide by the critical density, because this uh, this quantity here is dimensionless and it's just the uh, what fraction of the, the critical density is in this particular species. Okay? And when all said and done, I find uh, rho critical M Planck sigma V. Okay. So this is a known quantity. This is a known quantity. The present day entropy density is known. You can go look it up in the PDG. Uh, the only two outcomes of this whole exercise that we, that we want for the final answer is what is the freeze-out X, so what is the temperature at freeze-out, and what was this annihilation cross-section. Okay, and the interesting thing is, or one of the interesting things, is this uh, freeze-out uh, uh, temperature is only logarithmically sensitive to the, the, um, uh, the, to the parameters of the theory, right, to the scattering cross-section and the mass. And so what you find is if you take um, typical values for what we want to, what we'll want to call a WIMP. So a WIMP, remember the word weak is in the title for WIMP. So what we'll mean for the most part is something of order tens to hundreds of GeV to maybe thousands of GeV. So that's the mass scale we want to think about. But when you take a log, there's not much difference between 10 GeV and 1,000 GeV. Okay? And then uh, we'll be thinking of weak-like interactions, so the scattering cross-section will be weak scale in size, right? Meaning, so it'll be something like uh, sigma v will be something like alpha over m alpha squared over m w squared, something like that. Okay, and uh, as I said, m will be of order 100 GeV. So when you put all these numbers in, and even put in the the the, the slop that I, where I'm not being very precise about what these masses and cross sections are you typically find that you get X freeze out between about 20 and 30, which is to say you freeze out when the mass is 20 times bigger than the temperature. Okay? There is a G star in the entropy density. I didn't write it, though. Yeah. That uh, G star, yes, yes, yes. I, I, it does change with temperature, totally right. And it's typically at the temperatures at which you're freezing out, it's somewhere between 50 and 100, and, you know, depending on how many thresholds you've crossed. And also what additional states you have beyond the standard model, if any. Uh, and so, of course, to do this properly, you're totally right. You need to take into account that this G is temperature dependent. And, in fact, this, this scattering cross-section could be temperature dependent and all sorts of things, which is why when you do it honestly, you solve it on a computer. But 
um, the point here is to get some parametric behavior, which is what we're seeing. Okay, so um, so that's that's telling you this is approximately a constant for the types of models we will be interested in, and then that basically allows me to rewrite that expression in a more um, uh, um, pleasing form. I don't know. But then you'll see, so here is sort of an answer to your question. So for the purpose of this expression, I've, I've assumed it was somewhere between 50 and 100, and I assumed it was 80 to be precise. Oops, centimeters cubed per second. Okay, and this, uh, this fact has all sorts of names. Uh, which have no business being in physics, things like the miracle, but we won't, we won't say those words. Um, uh, but the, here's the point, right? We, we, already told you, we already saw the pie chart, and we know that, roughly speaking, the amount of dark matter is like, uh, the actual observed value, I think, is like 0.12 or something. What is that? I have it written down, so I might as well do it pro carefully. 0.118 from uh, uh, Planck and, and other uh, measurements combined. And so, and this this is the type of cross section you expect for a weak scale interaction. So this is this this is a. That's from one one oh, I am missing an h squared. Thank you. That's because I wasn't writing it here, but I was. Let me change this slightly. There we go. Thank you. And as I said, if you were to put in numbers here you would find you get something close to this, right? So this is all hanging together for something weak scale um, being a thermal relic. And that's why this is the uh, plot that launched a thousand papers, because there are many models out there where there are new weak scale states for other reasons, right? We, uh, there's the hierarchy problem, and that is another problem that launched maybe 10,000 papers. Um, and you often, in those models, end up having weak scale states with weak scale interactions. And uh, then you could imagine that they are the dark matter. And you have a very nice, complete story where you, you, you're impervious to what's going on. It's all driven by thermo thermodynamics. So you don't really care about the initial conditions. You just get into equilibrium, and then you fall out of equilibrium again. And you end up with the right amount of dark matter. But when I showed you that uh, long number line that went from here all the way to over there, I had a finite range for the WIMP mass. So let's discuss now why uh, that range was finite. And it's basically because of this scaling, right? That uh, um, the, cross, the, the leftover relic abundance here scales once you, uh, um, uh, at the twiddle level, it scales just simply as 1 over sigma v, OK? And, uh, um, and we, have, we have an upper bound on what, so omega scales as 1 over sigma v, roughly speaking. And we also know that this has to be less than roughly 0.12, something like that, OK? And I'll put that h squared back in. Um, no, I removed the angle brackets because I'm lazy. Um, OK, so if this was truly some state that just coupled to the weak interactions, I can work out what uh, sigma v would be approximately. I think I already wrote it down. Um, I wrote it down on the high temperature limit, but, no, but uh, that was the wrong thing to do. You should have shouted at me. Shame on you. Uh, so because it decouples right at uh, low temperatures, we know if there's weak scale interactions, it has to go to G Fermi squared. And then whatever makes up the units, there's only one other unit around, which is the mass. OK, and now that we see that this has, to be, uh, this has to be bigger than some number, right? Basically bigger than whatever, uh, once you put all the factors back in. But because there's an upper bound on the amount of dark matter that can be, there is a, a lower bound on the scattering cross-section, which ends up giving you a lower bound on the mass, which is the so-called <coughs> Lee-Weinberg bound. Right? And it tells you, if you have a state that annihilates only through weak interactions, then it better have a mass bigger than about 2 GV. Okay? So if it's a true textbook WIMP, it just uses uh, W and Z couplings to set its relic abundance. 
then there's a lower bound on its mass. Uh, so that sets one end of the number line. Then there's another bound, which is less wimpy in nature, but uh, because it doesn't allude to the weak interactions, but it says basically that any scattering cross-section shouldn't really grow any faster than, uh, shouldn't be any larger than this, just from on unitarity grounds. So, so from very, some very, very heavy state, uh, if there's only one scale in the problem, which is its mass, and that's an assumption, then I don't think the scattering cross-section should be bigger than, uh, maybe, maybe you don't like 4 pi appearing up here, maybe you think it should be 1, it all depends on your taste, but it won't really change the answer by much. Uh, and again, the same requirement that we don't overclose the universe ends up giving you a bound that the mass of the dark matter has to be less than, say, 50 TV. And so this is the, ends up being the reason why that was that finite range for what I wanted to consider to be a WIMP, right? So this is what we're going to be focusing on from now on, which is a state that uh, has some type of weak interactions with the standard model and lies somewhere between a few GV and uh, a few tens of TV. And in fact, I probably won't even get up close to this end of the range. And that's all driven by this thermal freeze-out story. Now, of course, um, this bound came from the statement that I only cared about uh, weak interactions. What if I was more general and there were some other interactions in the dark sector or some new light uh, gauge bosons that have some small coupling to the standard model but some large coupling to dark matter? What would this scattering cross-section look like? Well, it would look like uh, um, uh, some uh, gauge interaction in the dark sector. Uh, there's some mediator, right, which I'm going to call M dark. Uh, and then, uh, so it's exactly the same parametric form, but I've just have the freedom now to change the size of these couplings and the size of this mass because now it's a new mediator that I haven't yet seen. And then you see that uh, you can get, avoid this Lee Weinberg bound and get to far lower masses at the expense of introducing a new mediator in the dark sector. Right, so this, this bound of 2GV is very specific to, have it, to saying the interactions come from the, the weak interactions. But as I mentioned yesterday, I can't go as far down as I want because there are still constraints from BBN and warm dark matter constraints and things like this that put a, uh, other reasons to, to limit me going to arbitrarily uh, low dark matter mass for, a thermal, for, the, therm, for the thermal freeze-out story. Okay? Yes? Is it really possible to put uh, another of our bound on the mass basis as sort of granularity Oh, very good. Um, yes, but I don't think that bound would be very good. I mean, we already had this uh, 30 solar mass was sort of yeah. as large as I was willing to go. But in, in actuality, we don't know very much about the substructure of the halo. So there could be um, lots of substructure. There probably is. We just don't know. And that substructure could be, you know, maybe it's all in 10 to the 6 solar mass lumps which is way, way, way the hell up there, right? So it's, it's not going to, we know it can't be one object at 10 to the 12 solar masses just hanging out nearby. We would have noticed that the, that yeah. wouldn't have the right and dynamics. The local one is the other one that you presumably Yeah, so the local one, and I should have been more careful. When I say local, it's not that we actually know like where we're doing our experiments. Like on the Earth, we're sure that we have 0.4 GV per centimeter cubed. We sort of know in a sphere of some reasonable size which contains us, there is on average the density of uh, 0.4 GV per centimeter cube. But it could be that, again, there's substructure and that maybe on the order of, um, you know, tens of parsec scales, there are voids and over densities and things like that. And, and we've been doing experiments for 30 years and we've been moving at 200 kilometers a second in that time, so we haven't actually moved very far. So it's perfectly conceivable, although it's not a, a pleasant thought, that uh, we are living in a, in, in a hole in the distribution of dark matter and have been for the last 30 years and we may have to wait a thousand years for us to leave that void or we could be could be the converse right it could be that we're living in a, in a over density so so that that point four is is averaged on a very large scale local to us okay so i gave you one homework problem i expect to see the answers on my desk for the morning um let me give you another homework problem uh, which is more of a thought experiment, which is um, what would happen if you repeated the exercise for baryons, right? So repeat the, 
this freeze out story for the standard model baryons and work out what n uh, freeze out is for the, for, for the baryons. It's a fun little problem. Um, okay, so we've reached the end of the introduction. We were supposed to reach it half an hour ago, but such is life. Um, so let's recap slightly. Everything we now know about dark matter on one blackboard, dark matter stable. Uh, we have an interesting candidate, a WIMP, which is a WIMP thermal relic. Right, has a nice story. Uh, I should say that there is no state that can do this. So we know that dark matter is BSM physics. Yahoo! We found some BSM physics. Um, so let's now concentrate on this, because there are other lecturers who will concentrate on other, other things. So now we have this conundrum, right? Now what we want is we want a 100 GeV particle coupled to uh, the W and the Z, and therefore to the standard model. But it has to be stable. And that seems like a big ask. Right? Because all the heavy states around 100 GeV that we know of are very, very unstable in the standard model. Okay? And they're coupled to weak interactions. So what makes this guy special? Uh, and that leads us down uh, a uh, rabbit hole that will take us to supersymmetry. So one way of doing this is to, to, to answer this question of stable is to ask yourself, well, why is the proton stable and not the neutron stable? Because those are states around a GeV. One of them is stable, one of them is not. And it's because one of them carries a charge. So if this dark matter particle carried some sort of charge, and we know it can't be electric charge because we've already said it's dark, but if it carried some type of charge um, that would, uh, the, and it was the lightest state that carried that charge, then it would, uh, would be stable, right? Because it would have nothing else it could decay into. And so you end up with the idea of what are collectively called the LPOPs, right? So uh, one type of charge you could imagine having is a simple Z2, a simple parity, under which the standard model states are even and all the BSM states, including the dark matter, are odd. Okay? And then the dark matter becomes the lightest parity odd particle, and therefore, by virtue of carrying this parity and having no state lighter than it can decay into, it becomes totally stable and could be a dark matter candidate. And the reason I call this collectively is because there are many BSM models out there that have for reasons, in some cases, other than dark matter, the, the, the structure of the theory or some other requirement insists that there be a parity that separates the standard model states from the new states in the theory. Uh, there are many such theories, right? There's little, uh, uh, little Higgs theories, KK, uh, you know, uh, extra-dimensional theories, and supersymmetry, all of which have a, a parity associated with them. That means all the new states are odd, and then they have, within the structure of the theory themselves, for entirely different reasons, they're always invented for like solving the hierarchy problem or something. So the hierarchy problem often requires a parity, which then leads you to a LPOP, which could be dark matter, right? And the hierarchy problem has a connection to weak scale, obviously, and so then you have all the moving parts necessary for there to be a WIMP. And so, uh, and so that's why this WIMP paradigm has been around for so long. All right, great. Any questions before we move on in a dangerously fast fashion to everything you've ever wanted to know about supersymmetry and lots that you've never wanted to know? Yes? Oh, lightest parity odd particle. Sorry. Just a cute acronym. It's an ETLA, an extended three-letter acronym. Okay. Uh, supersymmetry. Here we go. The, uh, the first BSM theory that will be discovered at the LHC. Whether, whether it exists or not. Okay. Uh, so there is the Bible for this, uh, for understanding supersymmetry, is uh, a paper by Stephen Martin. 
Woods, but I think, I don't remember the full title, everybody just calls it the Primer, Susie Primer, right? It's a fantastic paper. He wrote it in 1997 or something and has been continuously updating it ever since. So it has, it, it's been evolving and morphing and it's, it's just superb. Um, so for all the details that I'm going to have to gloss over, you should uh, go see that paper. All right, so, so I'll give you a tiny history of supersymmetry. And one of the great things about, about the history is it shows you the, the power of no-go theorems, right? So no-go theorems are these statements that, oh, you can't possibly do this and uh, you shouldn't even try. And the great thing about no-go theorems is they're like a red flag to a bull. If you tell a physicist there's a no-go theorem, it can't be done, the first thing a th physicist says, oh yeah, watch me. So, um, and that was the case. There was the, um, the uh, uh, there was a no-go theorem from Coleman and Mandula, right, that said the most general, uh, the, the S-matrix, the most general S-matrix you can imagine, will be uh, the most symmetric S matrix you can imagine will be one that is symmetric under, so S matrix, symmetric under Poincaré symmetry plus internal symmetries. Right, so that's the best you can have. Sorry if my handwriting is terrible. Um, uh, that your, your, your theory will have uh, boost invariance and such, and then they'll have some gauge invariance, and that's the most symmetric theory you can imagine. And, and, and so people looked at this no-go theorem and said, okay, that's great, but then somebody noticed, as is the case with all no-go theorems, that there was a hidden assumption, and the hidden assumption behind, I mean, their, their result was just fine, right? They, they laid out their axioms or their assumptions, and they arrived at the correct conclusion. Uh, but the, as is the case with all no-go theorems, the, the, the the crux of the matter is usually in the assumptions you made. And the hidden assumption they had made is that the Lie algebra of all the symmetries you could imagine is defined, you know, in, in this way, right? With commutators. You write down some generator, one, generator two, and then you have some structure constants and some generator three. And that that's the definition of your Lie algebra, that you have some commutation matrices. And Ha, Glupazansky, and Sonius, I won't even write those names down because um, it's takes up too much time, um, showed that actually there's another way of defining a Lie algebra, or there's another version of, of uh, ways of introducing your generators called a graded Lie algebra. So they said you add the word graded to the beginning, and what you do is you replace square brackets with curly brackets, right? So you'd get uh, anti-commutators rather than commutators. And they said if you allow yourself uh, symmetries which uh, the, the group structure is defined in terms of these types of, op uh, these types of generators, or generators where this is the way you define the algebra. Um, and in particular, that these operators are fermionic in nature, then in fact, the most general S matrix is not Poincaré plus internal, but becomes super Poincaré. <coughs> so it's Poincaré with a cape on. Um, And then you can have a more symmetric S matrix. And this becomes, and this is indeed the most general uh, uh, invariant S matrix you can write down. Okay. Oh, and, and uh, because these generators are fermionic in nature, it's obvious that they take uh, bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons when you apply, uh, right? When you apply the action of the, of the group generator. Okay, so what? So there was a no-go theorem, and people got around the no-go theorem. Why do I care? Damn it. Any questions? Uh, and so there are various reasons you care. Um, so let's imagine you were able to write down such a theory that had this increased amount of symmetry. What are the other properties such a theory has? And uh, um, one of the properties we'll see is that because um, bosons get related to fermions and fermions get related to bosons in, this, uh, in, such, uh, in such theories, they provide a potential solution to the hierarchy problem, okay, which isn't going to be a major topic uh, of what we're, what we're going to talk about because we're majorly, may, mainly interested in the uh, dark matter side of things. Um, but, it, but it takes two seconds to explain it, and it is one of the major motivations for thinking about Susie, or why we used to think about Susie. So the hierarchy problem, I can't spell hierarchy. 
right, is just a statement that if you write down some field theory with uh, a scalar in it and a fermion in it, right, and uh, you give a mass to the fermion and um, some Yukawa coupling and then a potential for the scalar. Um, and we won't worry about symmetry breaking now. We'll just write down some... Uh, Oops. Right. Then you can look at this theory. You can calculate loop corrections in this theory. And in particular, you can look at the corrections to the mass of the fermion. So there's diagrams you can draw like this because there's a Yukawa interaction. There's a one loop diagram that corrects the fermion mass. Right. And you can calculate what this correction is. And. And I'm going to work in a theory with a hard cutoff just because it makes things pedagogically simpler. Okay, so you get a loop correction from this diagram and similarly you can calculate the uh, loop correction to the, oh whoops, can you still all see the relevant parts? Okay, you can calculate, there are two diagrams now for, the, for an equivalent loop correction for the uh, scalar, right? And you, uh, so one involving loop of fermions, one involving a self-interaction of the scalars and you can calculate what this loop correction is for the scalar mass, <laughs> and you see the you see what you knew was going to happen, right? That the fermion has a chiral symmetry that basically protects its mass, so that any loop correction is proportional to the mass itself. And there's no such symmetry for a scalar, and you uh, get the uh, usual hierarchy problem that scalars are quadratically sensitive to uh, to the high scales of physics, okay? But if you have a super Poincaré invariance and you have this new type of symmetry that relates a boson to a fermion, then you get to solve the boson's problems for free, right? Because the fermion already has a chiral symmetry by itself that solves this uh, hierarchy problem. And then you're telling me that in fact, behind the scenes, the uh, boson and fermion are secretly related to each other. Then uh, the boson must inherit some of the properties of the fermion and it must solve the hierarchy problem. And what we'll see is that if you have, I wrote down a very general scalar interacting with a fermion, but if I wanted to make this theory supersymmetric, then the symmetry, uh, or the, the supersymmetry requires various relationships between the couplings in the Lagrangian to make it supersymmetric. And in particular, it will require a relationship between lambda, between the Yukawa and the scalar self interaction in such a way that this quadratic divergence disappears. But the reason it disappears is because of a symmetry re reason relating the fermion to the boson, and the boson gets to pick up the chiral symmetry of the fermion. So that's one motivation to think about SUSY. Okay, another motivation, right, guts. So you all know how to do one loop uh, RGE evolution, okay, and uh, if you calculate you probably also know how to do two-loop RG evolution, but I don't, so I'm only going to do one loop. Um, so if you write down the beta function, uh, one loop for the gauge couplings in the standard model, and run them up to high scale, you find that they get suspiciously close to one another in such a way that you might think they're all secretly um, different sides of the same coin in some sense, that maybe the gauge couplings are all supposed to unify at some high scale. And... Uh, um, if you want another homework problem, I'm really laying it on thick today, um, uh, but it's all hidden in Steve Martin's uh, primer. You can stick these on a computer or just do it with a piece of graph paper, and you can see that in the standard model, these gauge couplings get pretty close to each other, up at about 10 to the 14 GV. But then if you take the standard model and supersymmetrize it, and I'll show you how to do that in detail later, these beta functions change and you see that, in fact, they get closer to one another and, rather nicely, at a higher scale. So if, if uh, the gauge couplings had unified at 10 to the 14 GeV, we would be in big trouble, right? Because the proton can decay in uh, grand unified theories through uh, exchange of XY bosons and things like that. And this scale is too low and the proton would be uh, too unstable. We would have noticed it. Um, uh, so this is... Another nice feature that comes out of supersymmetric theories is you get, uh, they, they, they make grand unified theories work better. Uh, another useful thing uh, 
you, you know that, uh, so that was number two. And number three, string theory needs Susie, right? Of course, it doesn't say anything about at what scale Susie has to be manifest. Uh, it could be only happening up at the Planck scale or the string scale or something. But it seems that super, uh, string theory doesn't make sense without supersymmetry. And so that's another reason to, uh, to study Susie. But we're going to study Susie because of this LPOP argument I gave you. That as we'll see in a minute, uh, all these other nice features which led us down this path of trying to understand supersymmetry and, and uh, the nice phenomenology it has. It has very interesting collider signatures and provides all these interesting things to go look for. Uh, along the way, it spits out a perfectly good uh, dark matter candidate and a perfectly good WIMP dark matter candidate. And if you like, I made this joke at the beginning, but as they say, many a true word is said in jest. The final reason to study SUSY, or at least to be familiar with SUSY, to have a working knowledge of it, which is hopefully what I'll give you, is that SUSY is the Esperanto of physics. Right? SUSY is the language by which experimentalists and theorists talk to one another. So, uh, um, unfortunately, for those of you who know anything about Esperanto, uh, it didn't have a happy ending. So maybe that, uh, maybe that analogy is not ideal, but, uh, or maybe it's even more apt than I realize. Um, so when you talk to your experimental colleagues and you're trying to convince them to, to go out and look for a new exotic signature, you often have to explain to them what type of new particle would lead to that particular splash of events in the calorimeter. And you invariably find that the easiest way to say, you don't want to say, oh, I want to have a, um, a fermion in the adjoint representation of color and then I want to have it decay to a scalar that's in the fundamental. You say, look, I have a gluino decaying to a squawk and then there's some missing energy, which is a neutralino. And then they'll totally get it. But if you try to explain it in terms of, and, and it may or may not actually be a supersymmetric model, but supersymmetry has enough interesting representations in it that you can always pick one out of Susie, and they know the language, and then you get to talk on, uh, on good terms. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the Esperanto. How do you spell Esperanto? Esperanto of HEP. And an, another way of saying that is it's a great signal generator, right? You can find lots of interesting pheno uh, for interesting final states for, for the LHC and other experiments to look at inside SUSY. Okay, so those are all the reasons why you should pay attention. That was basically a long setup because I'm about to do some horrible algebra. Are there any questions on the philosophy and motivation and what have you before I... Actually, I want to keep this. Nobody? You're all convinced? You all spreck in the Esperanto now? Is that actually Esperanto? Hmm? Is that actually Esperanto? What is Esperanto? No, that wasn't. No, I don't know what. <laughs> I can barely speak English, so. Um. Yeah, I should have worked out how to say hello, Boulder, in Esperanto. Okay. Um, so the, the language of Susie itself is a little different from the language of Peskin and Schroeder, right? You're used to thinking of, or maybe you're not, but uh, if you, in Peskin and Schroeder and many other textbooks, fermions are in Dirac representations, right? They're four component spinners. And it so happens that in uh, uh, supersymmetry, it's easy to think in terms of two component spinners. Um, and so that makes a little bit of connection to, to Kieran's lectures from yesterday. Uh, so we, so I will be talking not in terms of Dirac, four, four spinners, but in terms of decomposing them into Two, two spinners, right, uh, and, uh, oh, I should write down a great reference that will tell you more than you ever wanted to know about the difference between four component and two component and how to go between them. There's a paper by uh, one of Tillman's friends, Herbie and uh, Howie. Oh, and Steve Martin, I think, is on this paper. Okay, so I want to talk in terms of two component, which means I also need to decompose the usual Gelman matrices into uh, two component basis, right, the vial basis. And you, I think you probably know what these are, but I'll write them down anyway. Okay. Um, and Susie can get very, very thick with indices very fast, and I will do my best to suppress the indices, but let me just write down one thing f once and for all. 
uh, and then we'll try to forget about indices, but using this fact, you will be able to resuscitate them if you're so inclined. Uh, there is a two-component anti-symmetric tensor that comes in very useful uh, for raising and lowering um, indices, defined in the following way. It's like I said, it's anti-symmetric. Okay. And when we see uh, two component spinners put next to each other, I will, like I said, I'll suppress the indices, but it means I've contracted these two component spinners into a scalar, and I've contracted them in this way. So they have an index that I suppressed up here, and if they happen to be daggered, then by I will define this to be with a downstairs index. Okay, but that blackboard is hopefully all we'll have to do with indices, but there's enough information there that you can... Um, you can put all the indices back in if you get confused. Okay. So you can ask, the first thing you can ask yourself is what is the algebra that I've since erased for this solution, this, uh, this evasion of the no-go theorem, right? So you know what the Poincaré algebra is. You just have some generators, the translations, right, in uh, Lorentz space, and they commute with one another. And then on top of this, you get some uh, new generators that have the different types of brackets. They anti-commute with one another. And they have the following anti-commutation relations. And uh, this, is, this is the only non-zero one. So all the others that you could imagine writing down Qs with themselves will be zero. Okay, and then there the one more. Uh, P mu. So these these all commute with the with the generators of the boosts. Okay, so you take the normal Lorentz symmetry and you augment it in this way, and that will be the algebra of uh, the super algebra. Okay, and the, interest, the, the reason I wrote this down is so you can notice a couple of things. So first of all, an operation by a uh, SUSY generator commutes with P0 in particular, so it commutes with the Hamiltonian, so it doesn't do anything to the energy of the state. That's good. And if you apply two SUSY transformations in the right way, you just get a boost, right? So that's telling you somehow that these SUSY transformations are tied up with space-time uh, symmetry, right? Because if you do two of them, you just get a space-time translation, okay? And so then that leads you to a very nice formalism uh, that since this is now apparently a space-time symmetry, that maybe I shouldn't be thinking of space-time as being four-dimensional, but should I think of it as being slightly larger dimensional and including the uh, transformations in some, some direction associated with these generators, right? Because these generators are boosts in, you know, X, Y, Z, and T, and so on, right? Translations in various directions in, in four space. And these commute with them in just the right way to be a space-time translation. So some operation by this must be a translation in some new dimension that I can package up. And that leads you to the concept of superspace. And we'll see, in, in about five minutes' time, we'll see why this is all worth, well, hopefully we'll see why this is all worthwhile. Um, so the idea is you take the usual x mu that you're used to thinking about and extend it to have two extra directions. Or, yeah, I guess four extra directions, really, if I'm counting carefully. Right, because this alpha has two components. It's a two-component spinner. And this is the idea of superspace. These things are Grassmannian in nature, right? They're, to do, they're connected to spinners. These anti-commute with one another. Does that all make does those words mean something to everybody? Do you need me to write down the commutation, the anti-commutation relations, or does that, uh, okay. So, let's see. So what I claim is, oh, I didn't write down what the Qs were, I'm sorry. I was supposed to write down what these Qs actually were. Oh, I guess I couldn't have written it down until I introduced superspace. Okay, so, 
the Qs themselves are not unsurprisingly, they involve, you might have thought, oh, that's it. That would be the generator of uh, a translation in this superspace direction, right? In the same way that the P mu's are just d by dx mu, right? A translation in uh, real space is generated by this derivative. You might have thought that that was enough. You could just, uh, by analogy, but it doesn't quite work. Nothing is ever so easy. You need to get a little bit more, uh, you, you need more indices. It's the rule of thumb in SUSY. You always throw more indices at the problem. Okay, so that's Q. And then Q bar alpha dot is very similar. It's a translation in the other direction augmented by this. Mu, beta, alpha dot, d by d mu. Okay. And you can very easily put these into here and check that because of the way uh, thetas anti-commute with one another that you do indeed get this. And that these generators do satisfy the algebra and you, it all closes and everything makes sense. Uh, Questions that it's associated with a complex spinner, complex conjugate spinner. There's a good dagger. Yes. Is Q what now? Q bar and Q dagger. Yes. 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 Dagger and bar are just flip flop in notation. I'm sorry. I don't want you to get bamboozled by uh, the notation, but I feel it's useful to see it for, for reasons we'll get to. And I keep promising you in five minutes, but I, it's, uh, I'll try to get there. So, so in the same way that if you exponentiate, right, if you, if you exponentiate momentum, right, uh, you can act upon a state and translate it by exponentiating the generator of uh, translations. You can do the same thing with the, the SUSY generators. And now the parameters of the SUSY generators are, are fermionic. So this is a fermionic parameter just because the generator is fermionic in nature, and so I can only take an exponential of a scalar. Uh, so I have to have a fermionic parameter associated with it. So this would be, so if I act upon some field which is uh, at some point in this superspace, right, in this, and I act upon it with this, what it turns into is it turns into the same thing at a different place. So indeed, just as you would expect, it is acting as a translation in, uh, in four space and super space. Let me see, what have I got here? Theta bar plus I theta sigma mu. Oh wait, oh that's right, epsilon bar. Right, so you see that it's almost only a, tra it's a translation in the directions we expected, because in the same way that P mu is a translation in four space, Q is a translation in these theta directions. But then because it's mixed up in this non-trivial way with the Poincaré group, it also corresponds doing these operations to doing a translation in real space by an amount uh, which is basically epsilon times theta. Okay? It's meant to be uh, epsilon bar Q bar on the exponential. Yes, it is. Thank you. So why did I go through all of this? And basically, the reason you go through this is, is the same reason that you bother to introduce this kind of notation for Lorentz space, right? For, so you, you could, in principle, write all of your field theories in terms of t, x, y, and z, and then sit down and check that every field is translating in the right way under all the boosts, how the t's and the x's get mixed up and boosts in the z direction or in the x direction or whatever. But what you do is instead you package everything in a four vector and simply make sure that anything you write down doesn't have any hanging indices, right? That if you end up with some expression or some term in your Lagrangian that has some leftover index and doesn't look like this, so if you have just that, you've screwed up, right? Because you have a, it's not uh, invariant on the boost anymore because you have this leftover index, it's covariant. And we know that the Lagrangian we should write down should be invariant. So that's why we go to all this exercise of packaging things into four vectors. And in the same way, we decide to package everything into these, um, into the superspace. 
And then uh, it's, if you work in superspace, as long as you end up with no leftover explicit thetas anywhere, you will be OK. So an equivalent way of saying this is that now the Lagrangians you want to write down, or the actions, so act the action you usually write down, right, is an integral over uh, four space times the Lagrangian, which is a function of x mu, y mu, and all that stuff, but in, a, in ways in which they contract, right? Now what I'm saying is, if you want the, th the theory to be supersymmetric, you have to augment this and also integrate over, I didn't leave myself enough room, did I? Um, you also want to integrate over the, so now, if you integrate over these, all of superspace, and you have no hanging indices, so to speak, then the theory will be supersymmetric. And that is why it was useful to, uh, to introduce this nomenclature, or this notation, rather, not nomenclature. The other great thing, oh, the other great thing is that uh, thetas are, like I said, they, they are Grassmannian in nature. So um, Taylor series become even more easy than normal. Right? I don't, I, going to quadratic order in theta is not just because I'm lazy. It's all you can do. So if I take a general uh, field defined in superspace, it turns out that it has a very nice expansion. M here is not a mass, it's just because I've run out of letters. Theta bar squared theta rho plus theta bar squared theta squared d. Okay. So I can now expand a general superfield to, this is, as, this is as most as I can expand it in superspace, right? Because if I have more than two thetas, because of the anti-commuting nature, it will be zero. And so then if I can write everything in terms of superspace, then it looks like I only need how many fields? One, two, well, let's go through these. So this is a scalar. This is fermionic in nature because it's married up with a theta. This is another scalar, an anti-fermion. This is a scalar. This is a vector because it has to contract against this vector index here. Another fermion, another fermion, and another scalar. Okay? Uh, so this is a lot of fields, and it feels like it's rather more than the Lagrangian I unfortunately just erased. Right? I was claiming that the Lagrangian with just a Yukawa interaction between a, a complex scalar and, uh, and a fermion was enough to see supersymmetry. And so this feels like I, I've, uh, the superspace has brought a lot of baggage with it, right? Because if I write a general field in terms of these coordinates, I end up with a lot more fields than I think I actually need to realize superspace, to realize supersymmetry. Um, so that leads us to uh, the concept of uh, supermultiplets. And it turns out that, oh, I didn't write it down. Damn it. Okay. I've got to write one more index rich expression and then I think I'm done with indices. I can write down the equivalent of a covariant derivative in superspace, right? That anti, -com anti commutes with the generators. Uh, this is the same way in which d mu commutes with p mu. So everything is in analogy, it's just that. Uh, with fermionic indices, it gets tricky. D by D theta plus I sigma theta bar D mu. And there's another one for uh, D bar or D dagger minus D by, where can I do this? Let's do it here. Can you see here okay? Sorry, bad board management. D by D theta 
alpha minus i theta sigma d mu. Okay, so those are the two covariant derivatives that I can define that are uh, complementary to these generators. Okay, so let me go back here. And the reason I wanted to do this is because I claim this is way too many fields in general, so I need some way of restricting the number of fields I actually want to write down. Uh, and one way of doing that is to impose some sort of constraint on this field. So to say, this is the most general one, but I don't want the most general one. I want something that satisfies some condition that throws away a bunch of these extra, extra terms in the expansion. And so what you get, one of the ways of doing that is there are two fields, that, two types of uh, superfield that are very useful when you want to think about uh, supersymmetrizing the standard model. And we don't have time to go through both of them in detail. So I will just pick the one that will contain the matter. So this is useful for putting the quarks and the leptons into supersymmetry. This one is useful for putting the gauge bosons into supersymmetry. That's not how you spell gauge boson. Let's do it here. Okay, so what is this restriction? <coughs> so the chiral superfield is one who, uh, oh, wait. One which satisfies the fact that its covariant derivative, or one of the covariant derivatives, is zero on it. And then that, that uh, restriction, once you look over to that top right blackboard over there and see what d bar looks like, and require that d bar equals zero, will throw away a bunch of these fields. A bunch of these fields will be set to zero. And in particular, you'll find that uh, um, if you notice that d bar acting on theta equals zero, right? And the d bar acting on a particular combination of x, mu, and uh, so put an index there. So th these, are two, these are two quantities that are annihilated by the action of this covariant derivative. And so that means that if I want a field to be uh, annihilated by this covariant derivative, I can build that field as an expansion in just these quantities, just in terms of theta and what we typically call y. And then the most general field I can expand in terms of y and theta will satisfy this condition. And then we get to use a, take advantage of the fact of what I told you over here, that expansions in theta are really, really easy. Right? So if I only have thetas and not um, theta bars, so the only things this field can be written in terms of is oh, thetas and y's, then the most general field will be one which has got a scalar piece as a function of y, because then that will be killed by this condition. It has, and then this is the only time I'm going to worry about such normalization factors. It will have a fermionic piece, that's the linear term in the expansion uh, of theta. And then finally it'll have one more term, which is a scalar piece a function of y, but that's as, most, as much as I can have. So once I've imposed this, this uh, condition that makes a Carroll superfield, I actually have a field that only contains uh, a scalar, a fermion, and a scalar. And that sounds a lot more manageable and a lot more like the type of theory I was writing down at the beginning that I claimed I could make supersymmetric if I carefully picked the parameters. Right? Uh, and so that's, yes. Uh, that I don't want to have so many states, so many fields. So this chiral superfield is a, it's a field in superspace. So if I build a Lagrangian out of it and integrate over superspace in the way I told you, the theory should be supersymmetric. Uh, but I, I also know from my intuition that I shouldn't need this many states. So I can make a restricted multiple by just imposing this constraint at the beginning, saying I, and that is just like a short multiple. It just makes it... Uh, 
Okay, the other one that you could imagine writing down is the vector one I told you about a moment ago. I'm not going to go through the details, but they, the condition there is you require that it's a superfield that's, that's real, right? And then you can go through here and see the places where you have complex scalars and things and, and only pick out the real part of those complex scalars. And again, you will find that you get uh, fewer degrees of freedom. In fact, if you want, I can write down what the, the equivalent thing for the vector superfield looks like. And then you'll see why it was the one that you picked for the gauge bosons. So uh, 2 theta, sigma mu, theta bar, So if I impose that condition on the general one, it throws away a whole load of those fields. And all that I'm left with is a vector field that combines that. So I've again expanded in thetas and theta bars, and I end up with a vector field. I end up with the same fermion appearing in two different terms, but it had to appear this way because of the reality condition, and I end up with a different, uh, an, an additional real scalar. But this is good, right, because those of you who've heard anything about supersymmetry know that the gauge bosons of the standard model comes with superpartners, which will be fermionic in nature. So here you sort of see it. There's a gauge boson, and there's a fermionic partner, and there's an additional field that goes along for the ride that we'll do talk about a little bit in a minute. And the same thing is happening here in the Carroll superfield, right? I have a fermion, say, in the standard model that picks up a, a scalar partner, and then there's one additional uh, field that comes along for the ride that we'll have to deal with. Yes? So for the uh, that's expanded in X. Those are functions of X, yeah. And, and I could have expanded these, I could have, exp in the same way that I've already expanded in theta, I could have expanded these Y's, right? And I would end up with more terms, but they would all be in terms of only these fields, right? Because uh, uh, phi of Y will turn into phi of X plus theta times phi of X, blah, blah, blah. But the, the dynamical fields are just these these fermions and scalars. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? Is that like possible the fact that your vector field is an overall index? It doesn't look like it's a vector. It looks like the overall thing you get is a scalar. Uh, good. Yes. So this vector superfield is just, um, so the components within it are a four vector that has a four vector index, but it's packaged together into a superfield that's just a scalar. That's right. Yeah. So I will be able to write uh, in both cases, it's just a, a Lorentz scalar, and I'll be able to write Lagrangians in terms of just polynomials in these things, or exponentials, or whatever. But uh, um, but the it's, so that's the benefit of the the sort of super space thing is I end up writing down just simple um, <coughs> simple Lagrangians in terms of these scalar quantities. More questions? I think we've made it through most of the, the yes. No, you could uh, write down theories with uh, general superfields if you want. But these are the ones that turn out to be useful for uh, packaging up the MSSM. Yes? A complete basis, what do you mean? You wrote down a general field, right? Yeah. This is, the most com uh, this is the most general field I can write down in superspace. Yeah, where each of these are independent degrees of freedom and, and each of them are fields. Oh, I see what you're saying. With just Kyle and Vector. Um, yeah, I think so. You might need two of one and one of the other. But, yeah. The lambda and rho terms. The lambda, yeah, the lambda and rho terms are appearing here. That's right. So you may have to, to get to G, you may have to combine Kyle and the Vector. More questions? Yes. That's really basic. We started off introducing these two, the theta and theta bar for these uh, grass mini components. Why did we pick those two? Why not more? Oh, uh, good. Is that because what we want? Or? Uh, good. So that's because I only want to do n equals one supersymmetry. So if I wanted to do more supersymmetry, so that's to, it's to do with the counting of the number of supercharges. This is a great question. So 
Uh, how do we count the number of superchargers? So these are the superchargers, right? These are the, the generators of the supersymmetric uh, group, just in the uh, So how many generators are there? Well, they're fermionic in nature, and apparently they're complex as well. And they're fermionic, it's still up there. When I say fermion, I mean two-component fermion, vial fermions. So that counts four, right? So I need, uh, so there are four, n equals one Susie, which is all I care about is, I mean, it's not, that's all I care about in these lectures, um, has four superchargers. And so you need four coordinates to marry up with those charges. Now, if it did n equals two, that would be a doubling of the number of superchargers. There'd be eight superchargers. There'd be an additional index. And wouldn't you guys love that? There'd be an additional index on these, on these generators. And then I would need, need more. And it turns out that it's harder to, for larger than n equals one, the concept of superspace is not as useful. But as luck would have it, in, in, you can often uh, decompose n equals two uh, so the super multiplets in n equals 2 often can be decomposed into a collection of multiplets in n equals 1. Does that, does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay. So I apologize. It's not my fault that it's so uh, uh, index rich. Um, but uh, I feel it's useful to see it, if only once. Um, but we're almost to putting it to work, I hope. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, phew, I thought I'd erased the wrong board. Oh, no, I can do this, can't I? Okay, so there we are. We're staring at the chiral superfield because I didn't even want to introduce the vector superfield, but you made me. Um, so, uh, and I can act on it by the generators, which I think is the thing I just erased, unfortunately. But we talked about this a moment ago, right? And now I actually want to act just on the, the chiral superfield and ask what happens to each of the components when I do this. So what, I know what happens if I, uh, they act as translations in superspace, right? And so I know that, but phi, what do we say? Phi of x comma theta comma theta bar turns into phi of x plus theta mu, uh, what was it now? Theta epsilon uh, with a sigma in there. And then there was a bar in some way. Uh, maybe that one's bar, and this is theta bar to sigma epsilon. And then it turned into this, right? So then I can expand the right-hand side just in the same way I, uh, I did up there. And, I can, and then I can see how the individual components have transformed under the action of a super, uh, super symmetric transformation, okay? And so I can just compare component to component, and you can see that under a super symmetric transformation, that phi gets disturbed by delta phi, and that is just root two times epsilon times the spinner that's in the multiplet, and that del the, tra the um, correction to the fermion under this operation is this. This is a trivial exercise. If you wanted to have fun with uh, indices, it would take you about three minutes to, to do this. But since I've already set you so much homework for tomorrow, you may want to. Root two epsilon bar, poly matrix with a mu. Ah, and this is the point I wanted to make. Now I'm remembering what my notes were telling me. So. This component, the highest component, counting in terms of powers of theta, the highest component under a supersymmetric transformation gets uh, transformed by a total derivative, okay? Because it's just a total derivative on a fermionic field. That's the only field in this side of the thing. The rest are just constants. So that tells you that F is invariant under a supersymmetric transformation, right? Or rather, the integral of F, the d4x of F, is invariant, right? So if you build an action out of just Fs, then it will be uh, supersymmetric. Does that make sense? Because it transforms by a total derivative. Right, so in other words, what I'm saying is d4x of f is invariant. Under Susie. Oh, crap, I didn't even notice the time, sorry. Uh, 
Great. I think that's actually a good place to stop, because I was going to write down the simplest supersymmetric field theory and amaze you as to how simple it actually is once you've waded through all this algebra. Um, whoops. But since we've run out of time, I will do that next time. But uh, let me just tell you what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to take advantage of this fact to write down very, very simply in one line a supersymmetric uh, action for a supersymmetric field theory that will be just one line long. And it's guaranteed to be supersymmetric because I've taken advantage of this fact and the fact that I'm integrating over all of superspace, you know, the no hanging indices argument I made. And then with that, uh, with that very, very simple Lagrangian, we can expand it in terms of its component fields, in terms of the fermions and the scalars. And we can see that we're basically going to get back to that very, very simple action I wrote down at the beginning of a, a Yukawa a coupled scalar to a fermion. And that will be the path from beginning to end of supersymmetry. And then what we'll do is we'll take the standard model, which is a lot more complicated than that theory, and supersymmetrize it. And that will be trivial because we've done all this exercise. Okay? So now we're uh, ready to go. Sorry for running over.